Okay. Um, yep, yeah, my name is RJ Reyes, and uh, my micro talk, I guess you can say, is about uh, the funding options available for indie teams or indie studios. Uh, real quick about me. Uh, I've been in the games industry for 17 years. I've been a video game producer for about 13. Uh, I started uh, my production career in Vivendi Games, so I started the publisher side. But for the past uh, around 10 years, I've been almost entirely focused on, uh, on the indie space. So uh, I've been... Um, I've been working for multiple small, scrappy indie studios, and uh, together with them, uh, I've, I've asked for a lot of money. I've been uh, you know, scratching and clawing for uh, funding opportunities. So the, this subject and the stress that comes along with it is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So going right into it, the, uh, your funding options. So here's a list of funding options for indie studios. Uh, first and foremost, something to keep in mind, all of these different groups, they, uh, they have different goals, they're looking for different things, which means that you have to present yourself, present your project in different ways. Uh, each person, each team, each project is not going to be a good fit for every option. Uh, and we'll get a little bit more into that a little later. Uh, so among the options, first and foremost, there's self-funding, otherwise known as sweat equity. Um, well, you don't need me to explain what your goal is. Uh, nobody knows yourself better than you, than you, right? So all I will say about self-funding is it really does start with you. Because uh, if you're not willing to, I don't know, like uh, work weekends on your passion project, on your personal project, while also working a full-time job, if you're not willing to go into your savings to hire, you know, a couple of uh, contractors to help you with your passion project, project. So if you're not able, to, if you're not willing to invest in your own project, nobody else is going to be willing to. So I really do mean it starts with you. Uh, family funding, otherwise known as love equity, you don't self-explanatory. You don't need me to explain how you convince your parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles or whatever to invest in your project, loan you money, maybe give you some money for, for equity in your studio, whatever. So family funding. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail with some of these, starting with publishers. <clears throat> what publishers want? Uh, well, they want profit, obviously. Uh, so publishers are looking for games, awesome games that excite them, that uh, more importantly, that they can look at and, very, and uh, determine, we can help sell this game. We can market it. We can help with the discoverability. Um, they, they're also looking for games that strengthen their portfolio. So if you look at any publisher's website, you go to their, their games portfolio, you'll more often than not, you're going to see that there's themes or a thread that connects all their games whether it's a visual artistic theme, a gameplay theme, uh, like for example, uh, fellow Traveler, uh, the, the publishers Fellow Traveler and Annapurna Interactive, both of them focus on narrative games. So uh, obviously if you're making a very gritty shooter, don't go to Annapurna Interactive. They're not going to, they're just going to politely tell you, yeah, you're, you didn't do your research. Um, what else? Uh, publishers tend to be project focused rather than team focused. They don't want equity in your studio more, you know, usually. Instead, they want, you know, a rev share. They want uh, the split of the revenue from the project. So um, when a publisher gives an indie studio a funding advance, they expect to make that money back from the revenue share and then on top of that make profit off of that rev share so that's publishers uh the, the goal of the investor is to they're going to they want equity in your studio and the end goal is that your studio will eventually be sold for a, it's going to explode and be sold for a whole lot of money to i don't know ea activism blizzard ubisoft so um investors like publishers, they want profit, they want even more profit, but unlike publishers who just want a rev share of a single project, investors want equity in your studio. Uh, with that in mind, investors are more team focused rather than project focused. And um, like uh, real quick, if you go to gamesindustry.biz, Gamasutra, or your games industry news site of choice, you'll, you've probably seen over the past several weeks, the past several months, there are a bunch of stories about brand new studios that don't even have a first playable, they only have an idea that got like, I don't know, 10 to $25 million in investment funding 
because they're founded by veterans from Blizzard or uh, you know Activision, what have you. So uh, investors, they want huge profit. They want equity in your studio. They like veterans, and they also like live service games because obviously your live service games, your mobile games, uh, multiplayer games like Fortnite with microtransactions, those are the types of projects that make the most ludicrous amount of money, which obviously that attracts uh, investors. Um, okay, I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, so I'm kind of kind of fly by the the, the final slides. Um, government organizations. There are, uh, unfortunately, in my experience here in the US, there isn't a whole lot of government support. I think that's changing. I hope that's changing. But uh, right now I work for a Canadian studio and I'm shocked, pleasantly, pleasantly shocked by how much support they get uh, these indie studios in Montreal, Toronto, what have you, get from Canadian, the Canadian government. Um, the goal of, of the government organizations, of course, is to improve the local economy, create a bunch of local jobs. They want these studios to thrive so they can hire more local talent. Um, the application process for these government grants and, and funds tends to be really lengthy and intense, very competitive. But uh, the good news is, in some cases, there's, quote unquote, no strings attached, like they don't want their money back they just want you to create jobs uh and but some others treat it more like a loan like they want to get their money back by way of rev share revenue share uh okay art funds and grants i don't know a lot about these so i'm just going to skip past this real quick uh just uh, real uh, if you want an example of an art fund look at the astra fund um and basically they they uh they support games and game makers that fit a certain criteria and it's kind of uh, I, uh, the most no strings attached funding option that I've seen in that they give money and it's like they just say continue making the kind of games you've already been making uh, okay final slide Another, the final option, work for hire. This is when your studio makes, I don't know, like a web game, uh, video games for businesses, like a web game for Disney or a web game for DunkinDonuts.com or whatever. And using the work for hire contract money, you pay the bills and then on the side, you work on your original passion project. Whew, okay. So forgive me for speeding through that. I think I'm still over anyway. Um, but uh, once again, my name is RJ Reyes. Here's my Discord info. Uh, I'm going to share the slides. I'm, I'll share my presentation. So if it's useful to anyone, you'll see it. And uh, if anyone has any questions, now's the time to ask. There's my Discord info. You can ask me direct message there as well. And that is it for me. All right. We got time for a couple of questions. I know that uh, we ran into some technical issues there. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we can take like one or two. If anyone has them, please remember you can use the Q&A panel on there. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if too many of the, the government funding options, generally speaking, like I, I did brief QA for a company in, in Norway and most of the funding there were like, those were educational games. So we're primarily looking at uh, funding options in um, uh, funding uh, funding there was mostly through like educational services and things like that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. First one comes from Floyd, who just wants a, a quick primer on what a live service game is. Live service game, otherwise known as games as a service, otherwise known as GA gas, G A A S. Um, it's a game that uh, like theoretically doesn't stop. Uh, so like uh, Fortnite is considered a, a live service game. So it's multiplayer. It uh, it doesn't you know it it, um, it there are constant updates. There are events, and the idea is that uh, by way, because the game continues to continues to live and continues to be updated, and uh, more often than not they include microtransactions. So in in other words, there's no ceiling. There's no limit to how much money this single project can make. Uh, another uh, probably a, 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 another example. Grand Theft Auto Online. Grand Theft Auto Online has made a ridiculous amount of revenue. So I think it's like you know, every single year there's a new report of how much GTA O has made, and it just dwarfs how much the single player version makes. So yeah, live service games, games that you know pretty much just live indefinitely and just keep soaking up money indefinitely. Yeah. Um, so and those, of course, are the games that investors, because they want the biggest profit, investors are most interested in those kinds of games. Absolutely. Mobile as well. And uh, last question from Micah. Is, is it difficult for American game designers to work in other countries remotely, such as Canada? Well, the funny thing is, so I I, uh, I live in New Jersey, so I'm just over the bridge from you, from you folks. Hey. Uh, I work completely for 
all of this year or most of this year, I've been fully remote. The only fully remote American team member of uh, the studio I work for is called Miscellaneum Studios. It's a small indie studio located in Montreal. Um, so I'm not going to say it's easy, but I'm an example of an American game dev who works fully remote for a Canadian studio. And uh, it was my first experience doing this. And uh, I'm surprised by like the paperwork wasn't bad. Um, you know, getting paid wasn't, wasn't complicated either. So from my experience, it was surprisingly easy, um, uh, I guess. Uh, but finding that work, uh, that of course, finding work is always challenging, right? But uh, I guess you can say if there's a silver lining to the pandemic and whatnot, it's increased the uh, pre prevalence of remote work. So um, yeah, it's uh, finding work is always challenging, but it's not as challenging to find work as an American for a Canadian game company with the world being the way it is now. <laughs> uh, Rob has an, our, has a question too, asking uh, if you've ever seen funding go bad, like say a studio not meeting the demand of the funder. Um, you know, the funny thing is just today I heard a horror story that, uh, so I'm not going to go into details, but, uh, and it's someone I don't really know. It's, uh, I'm part of like 50 different Discord servers and a lot of them are game dev, professional game dev servers. So this person I don't know just shared a horror story, like they're, they, they have a studio and um, they just went through uh, the publisher agreement, the contract, I guess, I don't have, a, I don't have, re I really don't have the details. It got canceled. So, you know what, I, I, maybe I shouldn't use that as an example. What, going, going way back when I used we to can, for, We can cut this from the recording. Okay, yeah, well, <laughs> just, so forget, forget any said, said anything. In fact, I said nothing, we'll just, okay. Um, going back to my personal experience, when I worked for Vivendi Games, specifically Sierra Online, um, we actually had to cut a, um, a project because the developer in that publisher agreement, you know, uh, there was a milestone review, obviously, uh, every single milestone. And in one of the earlier milestones, like um, pre alpha, so like the second or third milestone, what they submitted to us was pretty bad. Um, and because of that, you know, using the process that was laid out in the contract, we unfortunately had to had to cut the we had to stop the project because the um, uh, the milestone that they presented us to us was just so bad that um, you know like you know, the review went as as bad as it can get, and unfortunately the project had to be had to be canceled. So the uh, I, I don't know if it's good news, but at least it happened early. So it's not like the project was really close to being complete and then just got scrapped at the end. It was one of the earlier milestones. It just wasn't working out and it had to, um, but obviously it's bad news for the dev because then they, they had to look for other work. Um, yeah, absolutely. But you're right. I mean, generally if, if something's really go wrong, it's better that happens earlier than later because yeah. it's easier for everyone, devs included, to cut their losses. So. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, RJ. That was really great. I agree. A couple of people said that, that like that could be make for a full length presentation. Um, that was really good. Thank you so much for the primer. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank appreciate you for having it. me.